Section 69 of A Popular History of France, Volume 5. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 5, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 48. Louis the Fourteenth, Literature and Art. Part 4. Madame de Sévigny would have very much scandalized those gentlemen of Port Royal, if she had let them see into the bottom of her heart as she showed it to her daughter. Pascal used to say, quote, There are but three sorts of persons, those who serve God, having found him, those who employ themselves in seeking him, not having found him, and those who live without seeking him, or having found him. The first are reasonable and happy, the last are mad and miserable, the intermediate are miserable and reasonable, end quote without ever having sought and found god in the absolute sense intended by pascal madame de sevigny kept approaching him by gentle degrees quote, we are reading a treatise by m namon of port royal on continuous prayer though he is a hundred feet above my head he nevertheless pleases and charms us one is very glad to see that there have been and still are in the world people to whom god communicates his holy spirit in such abundance but o oh god when shall we have some spark some degree of it how sad to find one's self so far from it and so near to something else oh fie let us not speak of such plight as that it calls for sighs and groans and humiliations a hundred times a day after having suffered so much from separation and so often traversed france to visit her daughter in provence madame de sevigny had the happiness to die in her house at grignan she was sixty-nine and she had been ill for some time she was subject to rheumatism her son's wildness had for a long while retarded the arrangement of her affairs at last he had turned over a new leaf he was married he was a devotee madame de grignan had likewise found a wife for her son whom the king had made a colonel at a very early age and a husband for her daughter little pauline now madame de simian all this together is extremely nice and too nice wrote madame de sevigny to m de bussy for i find the days going so fast and the months and the years that for my part my dear cousin i can no longer hold them time flies and carries me along in spite of me it is all very fine for me to wish to stay it it bears me away with it and the idea of this causes me great fear you will make a pretty shrewd guess why death came at last and madame de sevigny lost all her terrors she was attacked by smallpox whilst her sick daughter was confined to her bed and died on the nineteenth of april sixteen ninety six thanking god that she was the first to go after having so often trembled for her daughter's health quote, what calls far more for our admiration than for our regrets writes m de grignan to m de coulanges is the spectacle of a brave woman facing death of which she had no doubt from the first days of her illness with astounding firmness and submission this person so tender and so weak towards all that she loved showed nothing but courage and piety when she believed that her hour was come and we could not but remark of what utility and of what importance it is to have the mind stocked with good matter and holy reading for the which madame de sevigny had a liking not to say a wonderful hungering from the use she managed to make of that good store in the last moments of her life she had often taken her daughter to task for not being fond of books quote, there is a certain person who undoubtedly has plenty of wits, but of so nice and so fastidious a sort, that she cannot read anything but five or six sublime works, which is a sign of distinguished taste. She cannot bear historical books, a great deprivation this, and of that which is a subsistence to everybody else. She has another misfortune, which is that she cannot read twice over those choice books which she esteems exclusively. This person says that she is insulted when she is told that she is not fond of reading. Another bone to pick." End quote. Madame de Sévigny's liking for good books accompanied her to the last, and helped her to make a good end. All the women who had been writers in her time died before Madame de Sévigny. Madame de Motteville, a judicious and sensible woman, more independent at the bottom of her heart than in externals, had died in 1689, exclusively occupied from the time that she lost Queen Anne of Austria, in the works of piety and in drawing up her memoir. Madame de Montpensier, quote, my great mademoiselle, as Madame de Sévigny used to call her, had died at Paris on the 5th of April, 1693, after a violent illness as feverish as her life. Impassioned and haughty, with her head so full of her greatness that she did not marry in her youth, thinking nobody worthy of her except the king and the emperor, who had no fancy for her, and ending by a private marriage with the Duke of Lausanne, quote, a cadet of Gascony, end quote, whom the king would not permit her to espouse publicly, clever courageous hair-brained generous she has herself sketched her own portrait quote, i am tall neither fat nor thin of a very fine and easy figure i have a good mien arms and hands not beautiful but a beautiful skin and throat too 
I have a straight leg and a well-shaped foot. My hair is light and of a beautiful auburn. My face is long, its contour is handsome, nose large and aquiline, mouth neither large nor small, but chiselled, and with a very pleasing expression. Lips vermilion, teeth not fine, but not frightful either. My eyes are blue, neither large nor small, but sparkling, soft and proud like my mien. I talk a great deal, without saying silly things or using bad words. I am a very vicious enemy, being very choleric and passionate, and that, added to my birth, may well make my enemies tremble. But I have also a noble and a kindly soul. I am incapable of any base and black deed, and so I am more disposed to mercy than to justice. I am melancholic, I like reading good and solid books. Trifles bore me, except verses, and them I like, of whatever sort they may be, and undoubtedly I am as good a judge of such things as if I were a scholar." A few days after Mademoiselle died, likewise at Paris, Madeleine de Lavergne, Marchioness of Lafayette, the most intimate friend of Madame de Sévigny, quote, Never did we have the smallest cloud upon our friendship, the latter would say. Long habit had not made her merit stale to me. The flavour of it was always fresh and new. I paid her many attentions from the mere prompting of my heart, without the propriety to which we are bound by friendship having anything to do with it. I was assured, too, that I constituted her dearest consolation, and for forty years past it had always been the same thing." Sensible, clever, a sweet and safe acquaintance, Madame de Lafayette was as simple and as true in her relations with her confidants as in her writings. La Princesse d'Olive alone has outlived the times and the friends of Madame de Lafayette. Following upon the quote -unquote, great sword thrusts of La Calprenède or Mademoiselle de Scudery, this delicate, elegant, and virtuous tale, with its pure and refined style, enchanted the court, which recognized itself at its best, and painted under its brightest aspect. It was farewell to ever to the quote -unquote, pays de tendre. Madame de Lafayette had very bad health. She wrote to Madame de Sévigny on the 14th of July, 1693, quote, here is what I have done since I wrote to you last. I have had two attacks of fever. For six months I had not been purged. I am purged once. I am purged twice. The day after the second time I sit down to table. Oh, dear, I feel a pain in my heart. I do not want any soup. I have a little meat, then. No, I do not want any. Well, you will have some fruit. I think I will. Very well, then have some. I don't know. I think I will have something by and by. Let me have some soup and a chicken this evening. Here is the evening, and there are the soup and the chicken. I don't want them. I am nauseated. I will go to bed. I prefer sleeping to eating. I go to bed. I turn round. I turn back. I have no pain, but I have no sleep either. I call. I take a book. I shut it up. Day comes. I get up. I go to the window. It strikes four, five, six. I go to bed again. I doze till seven. I get up at eight. I sit down to table at twelve, to no purpose, as yesterday. I lay myself down in my bed again in the evening, to no purpose, as the night before. Are you ill? Nay, I am in this state for three days and three nights. At present I am getting some sleep again, but I still eat merely mechanically, horsewise, rubbing my mouth with vinegar, otherwise I am very well, and I haven't even so much pain in the head." Fault was found with Madame de Lafayette for not going out. Quote, she had a mortal melancholy. What absurdity again! Is she not the most fortunate woman in the world? That is what people said, writes Madame de Sévigny. It needed that she should be dead to prove that she had good reason for not going out, or for being melancholy. Her reins and her heart were all gone. Was not that enough to cause those fits of despondency of which she complained? And so during her life she showed reason, and after her death she showed reason, and never was she without that divine reason which was her principal gift." Madame de Lafayette had in her life one great sorrow, which had completed the ruin of her health. On the 16th of March, 1680, after the closest and longest of intimacies, she had lost her best friend, the Duke of La Rochefoucauld. Carried away in his youth by party strife and an ardent passion for Madame de Longueville, he had at a later period sought refuge in the friendship of Madame de Lafayette. Quote, when women have well-formed minds, he would say, I like their conversation better than that of men. You find with them a certain gentleness which is not met with amongst us, and it seems to me, besides, that they express themselves with greater clearness, and that they give a more pleasant turn to the things they say." A meddler and intriguer during the Fronde, sceptical and bitter in his Maxime, the Duke of La Rochefoucauld was amiable and kindly in his private life. Factions in the courts had taught him a great deal about human nature. It's, he had seen it and judged of it from its bad side. Witty, shrewd, and often profound, he was too severe to be just. The bitterness of his spirit breathed itself out completely in his writings. He kept for his friends that kindliness and that sensitiveness of which he made sport. Quote, he gave me wit, Madame de Lafayette would say, but I reformed his heart. 
He had lost his son at the passage of the Rhine in 1672. He was ill, suffering cruelly. Quote, I was yesterday at M. de La Rochefoucauld's, writes Madame de Sevigny in 1680. I found him uttering loud shrieks. His pain was such that his endurance was quite overcome without a single scrap remaining. The excessive pain upset him to such a degree that he was sitting out in the open air with a violent fever upon him. He begged me to send you word, and to assure you that the wheel-broken do not suffer during a single moment what he suffers one half of his life, and so he wishes for death as a happy release. He died with Bossuet at his pillow. Quote, Very well prepared as regards his conscience, says Madame de Sevigny again. That is all settled. But in other respects it might be the illness and death of his neighbour which is in question. He is not flurried about it. He is not troubled about it. Believe me, my daughter, it is not to no purpose that he has been making reflections all his life. He has approached his last moments in such wise that they have had nothing that was novel or strange for him. M. de La Rochefoucauld thought worse of men than of life. Quote, I have scarcely any fear of things, he had said. I am not at all afraid of death. End quote. With all his rare qualities and great opportunities, he had done nothing but frequently embroil matters in which he had meddled, and had never been anything but a great lord with a good deal of wit. Actionless penetration and sceptical severity may sometimes clear the judgment and the thoughts, but they give no force or influence that has power over men. Quote, there was always a something, or je ne sais quoi, about M. de la Rochefoucauld, writes Cardinal de Retz, who did not like him. He was for meddling in intrigues from his childhood, and at a time when he had no notion of petty interests, which were never his foible, and when he did not understand great ones, which on the other hand were never his strength. He was never capable of doing anything in public affairs, and I am sure I don't know why. His views were not sufficiently broad, and he did not even see comprehensively all that was within his range. But his good sense, very good, speculatively, added to his suavity, his insinuating style, and his easy manners, which are admirable, ought to have compensated more than it did for his lack of penetration. He always showed habitual a resolution, but I really do not know to what to attribute this irresolution. It could not with him have come from the fertility of his imagination, which is anything but lively. He was never a warrior, though he was very much the soldier. He was never a good partyman, though he was engaged in it all his life. That air of bashfulness and timidity which you see about him in private life was turned in public life into an air of apology. He always considered himself to need one, which fact, added to his maxims, which do not show sufficient belief in virtue, and to his practice, which was always to get out of affairs with as much impatience as he had shown to get into them, leads me to conclude that he would have done far better to know his own place, and to reduce himself to passing, as he might have passed, for the most polite of courtiers and the worthiest, or le plus honnête, man, as regards ordinary life, that ever appeared in his century." Cardinal de Retz had more wits, more courage, and more resolution than the Duke of La Rochefoucauld. He was more ambitious and more bold. He was, like him, meddlesome, powerless, and dangerous to the state. He thought himself capable of superseding Cardinal Mazarin, and far more worthy than he of being premier minister. But every time he found himself opposed to the able Italian, he was beaten. All that he displayed during the fronde of address, combination, intrigue, and resolution would barely have sufficed to preserve his name in history if he had not devoted his leisure in his retirement to writing his memoir. Vigorous, animated, always striking, often amusing, sometimes showing rare nobleness and high-mindedness, his stories and his portraits transport us to the very midst of the scenes he desires to describe, and the personages he makes the actors in them. His rapid, nervous, picturesque style is the very image of that little dark, quick, agile man, more soldier than bishop, and more intriguer than soldier, faithfully and affectionately beloved by his friends, detested by his very numerous enemies, and dreaded by many people, for the causticity of his tongue, long after the troubles of the Fronde had ceased, and he was reduced to be a wanderer in foreign lands, still Archbishop of Paris, without being able to set foot in it. Having retired to Commercy, he fell under Louis the Fourteenth's suspicion. Madame de Sévigny, who was one of his best friends, was anxious about him. Quote, as to our cardinal, I have often thought as you, she wrote to her daughter, but whether it be that the enemies are not in condition to cause fear, or that the friends are not subject to take alarm, it is certain that there is no commotion. You show a very proper spirit in being anxious about the welfare of a person who is so distinguished, and to whom you owe so much affection. Quote, Can I forget him who I see everywhere in the story of our misfortunes, exclaimed Bossuet in his funeral oration over Michael Le Tellier that man so faithful to individuals, so formidable to the state, of a character so high that he could not be esteemed or feared or hated by halves, that steady genius whom, the while he shook the universe, we saw attracting to himself a dignity which in the end he determined to relinquish as having been too dearly bought, as he had the courage to recognize in the place that is the most eminent in Christendom, 
and as being after all quite incapable of satisfying his desires so conscious was he of his mistake and of the emptiness of human greatness but so long as he was bent upon obtaining what he was one day to despise he kept everything moving by means of powerful and secret springs and after that all parties were overthrown he seemed still to uphold himself alone and alone to still threaten the victorious favourite with his sad but fearless gaze End quote. When Bossuet sketched this magnificent portrait of Mazarin's rival, Cardinal de Retz had been six years dead in 1679. Mesdames de Sévigny and de Lafayette were of the court, as were the Duke of La Rochefoucauld and Cardinal de Retz. La Bruyère lived all his life rubbing shoulders with the court. He knew it, he described it, but he was not of it, and could not be of it. Nothing is known of his family. He was born at Dourdan in 1639, and had just bought a post in the treasury, or trésorier de France, at Cayenne, when Bossuet, who knew him, induced him to remove to Paris as teacher of history to the duke, grandson of the great Condé. He remained forever attached to the person of the prince, who gave him a thousand crowns a year, and he lived to the day of his death at Condé's house. Quote, he was a philosopher, says Abbé d'Olivet, in his Histoire de l'Académie Française. All he dreamt of was a quiet life, with his friends in his books, making a good choice of both, not courting or avoiding pleasure, ever inclined for moderate fun, and with a talent for setting it going, polished in manners and discreet in conversation, dreading every sort of ambition, even that of displaying wit." End quote. This was not quite the opinion formed by Boileau of La Bruyère. Quote, Maximilian came to see me at Auteuil, writes Boileau to Racine on the 19th of May, 1687, the very year in which the Caractère was published. He read me some of his Theoprastus. He is a very worthy or honnête man, and one who would lack nothing if nature had created him as agreeable as he is anxious to be. However, he has wit, learning, and merit. End quote. Amidst his many and various portraits, La Bruyère has drawn his own with an amiable pride. Quote, I go to your door, Stéphane. The need I have of you hurries me from my bed and from my room. Would to heaven I were neither your client nor your bore. Your slaves tell me that you are engaged and cannot see me for a full hour yet. I return before the time they appointed, and they tell me that you have gone out. What can you be doing, Stéphane, in that remotest part of your rooms, of so laborious a kind as to prevent you from seeing me? You are filing some bills, you are comparing a register, you are signing your name, you are putting the flourish. I had but one thing to ask you, and you had but one word to reply, yes or no. Do you want to be singular? Render service to those who are dependent upon you, you will be more so by that behaviour than by not letting yourself be seen. O oh, man of importance and overwhelmed with business, who in your turn have need of my offices, come into the solitude of my closet. The philosopher is accessible. I shall not put you off to another day. You will find me over those works of Plato which treat of the immortality of the soul and its distinctness from the body, or with pen in hand to calculate the distances of Saturn and Jupiter. I admire God in his works, and I seek by knowledge of the truth to regulate my mind and become better." Come in, all doors are open to you. My antechamber is not made to wear you out with waiting for me. Come right in to me without giving me notice. You bring me something more precious than silver and gold, if it be an opportunity of obliging you. Tell me, what can I do for you? Must I leave my books, my study, my work, this line I have just begun? What a fortunate interruption for me is that which is of service to you. End, quote. End of section 69. Section 70 of A Popular History of France, Volume 5. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 5, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 48. Louis XIV. Literature and Art. Part 5. From the solitude of that closet went forth a book unique of its sort, full of sagacity, penetration, and severity, without bitterness a picture of the manners of the court and of the world, traced by the hand of a spectator who had not essayed its temptations, but who guessed them and passed judgment on them all, quote, a book, as M. de Malézieux said to La Bruyère, which was sure to bring its author many readers and many enemies, end quote. Its success was great from the first, and it excited lively curiosity. The courtiers liked the portraits, the attempts were made to name them, the good sense, shrewdness, and truth of the observation struck everybody. People had met a hundred times those whom La Bruyère had described. The form appeared of a rarer order than even the matter. It was a brilliant, uncommon style, as varied as human nature, always elegant and pure, original and animated, rising sometimes to the height of the noblest thoughts, gay and grave, pointed and serious. 
avoiding by richness in turns and expression the uniformity native to the subject la bruyere riveted attention by a succession of touches making a masterly picture a terrible one sometimes as in his description of the peasant's misery Quote, to be seen are certain ferocious animals male and female scattered over the country dark livid and all scorched by the sun affixed to the soil which they rummage and throw up with indomitable pertinacity they have a sort of articulate voice and when they rise to their feet they show a human face they are in fact men at night they withdraw to the caves where they live on black bread water and roots they spare other men the trouble of sowing tilling and reaping for their livelihood and deserve therefore not to go in want of the very bread they have sown few people at the court and in la bruyere's day would have thought about the sufferings of the country folks and conceived the idea of contrasting them with a sketch of a court ninny quote, gold glitters say you upon the clothes of philemon it glitters as well as the tradesman's he is dressed in the finest stuffs are they a whit the less so when displayed in the shops and by the piece nay but the embroidery and the ornaments add magnificence thereto then i give the workman credit for his work if you ask him the time he pulls out a watch which is a masterpiece his sword-guard is an onyx he has on his finger a large diamond which he flashes into all eyes and which is perfection he lacks none of those curious trifles which are worn about one as much for show as for use and he does not stint himself either of all sorts of adornment befitting a young man who has married an old millionaire you really piqued my curiosity i positively must see such precious articles as those send me that coat and those jewels of philemon's you can keep the person thou art wrong philemon if with that splendid carriage and that large number of rascals behind thee and those six animals to draw thee thou thinkest thou art thought more of we take off all those appendages which are extraneous to thee to get at thyself who are but a ninny more earnest and less bitter than la rochefoucauld and as brilliant and as firm as cardinal de retz la bruyere was a more sincere believer than either quote, i feel that there is a god and i do not feel that there is none that is enough for me the reasoning of the world is useless to me i conclude that god exists are men good enough faithful enough equitable enough to deserve all our confidence and not make us wish at least for the existence of god to whom we may appeal from their judgments and have recourse when we are persecuted or betrayed a very strong reason and of potent logic naturally imprinted upon an upright spirit in a sensible mind irresistibly convinced both of them that justice alone can govern the world la bruyere had just been admitted into the french academy in sixteen ninety three in his admission speech he spoke in praise of the living bossuet fenelon racine la fontaine it was not as yet the practice those who were not praised felt angry and the journals of the time bitterly attacked the new academician he was hurt and withdrew almost entirely from the world four days before his death however quote, he was in company all at once he perceived that he was becoming deaf yes stone deaf he returned to versailles where he had apartments at conde's house apoplexy carried him off in a quarter of an hour on the eleventh of may sixteen ninety six end quote, leaving behind him an incomparable book wherein according to his own maxim the excellent writer shows himself to be an excellent painter and four dialogues against quietism still unfinished full of lively and good-humoured hostility to the doctrines of madame guyon they were published after his death we pass from prose to poetry from la bruyere to corneille who had died in sixteen eighty four too late for his fame in spite of the vigorous returns of genius which still flash forth sometimes in his feeblest works throughout the regency and the fronde corneille had continued to occupy almost alone the great french stage Rotrou, his sometime rival with his piece of Venceslas, and ever tenderly attached to him, had died in 1650, at Dreux, of which he was civil magistrate. An epidemic was ravaging the town, and he was urged to go away. Quote, I am the only one who can maintain good order, and I shall remain, he replied. At the moment of my writing to you, the bells are tolling for the twenty-second person to-day. Perhaps to-morrow it will be for me, but my conscience has marked out my duty. God's will be done. End quote. Two days later he was dead. Corneille had dedicated Polyeucte to the regent Anne of Austria. He published in a single year Rodogune and Mort de Pompée, dedicating this latter piece to Mazarin, in gratitude, he said, for an act of generosity with which his eminence had surprised him. At the same time he borrowed from the Spanish drama the canvas of the Menteur, the first really French comedy which appeared on the boards, and which Molière showed that he could appreciate at its proper value. 
after this attempt due perhaps to the desire felt by corneille to triumph over his rivals in the style in which he had walked abreast with them he let tragedy resume its legitimate empire over a genius formed by it he wrote heraclius and nicomede which are equal in parts to his finest masterpieces but by this time the great genius no longer soared with equal flight theodore and pertherite had been failures quote, i don't mention them corneille would say in order to avoid the vexation of remembering them end quote he was still living at rouen in a house adjoining that occupied by his brother thomas corneille younger than he already known by some comedies which had met with success the two brothers had married two sisters quote, their houses twain were made in one with keys and purse the same was done their wives can never have been two their wishes tallied at all times no games distinct their children knew the fathers lent each other rhymes same wine for both the drawers drew it is said that when peter corneille was puzzled to end a verse he would undo a trap that opened into his brother's room shouting quote, sans souci a rhyme end quote. corneille had announced his renunciation of the stage he was translating into verse the imitation of christ quote, it were better he had written in his preface to pertherite that i took leave myself instead of waiting till it is taken of me altogether it is quite right that after twenty years work i should begin to perceive that i am becoming too old to be still in the fashion this resolution is not so strong but that it may be broken there is every appearance however of my abiding by it fouquet was then in his glory quote, no less superintendent of literature than of finance end quote, and he undertook to recall to the stage the genius of corneille at his voice the poet and the tragedian rose up at a single bound quote, i feel the self-same fire the self-same nerve i feel that roused the indignant cid rove home horatius as steel as cunning as of yore this hand of mine i find that sketched great pompey's soul depicted sinna's mind wrote corneille in his thanks to fouquet he had some months before said to mademoiselle dupart who was an actress in moliere's company which had come to rouen and who was from her grand airs nicknamed by the others the marchioness quote, marchioness if age hath set on my brow his ugly dye at my years pray don't forget you will be as old as i yet do i possess of charms one or two so slow to fade that i feel but scant alarms at the havoc time hath made you have such as men adore but these that you scorn to-day may perchance be to the fore when your own are worn away these can from decay reprieve eyes i take a fancy to make a thousand years believe whatsoe'er i please of you with that new that coming race who will take my word for it all the warrant for your face will be what i may have writ corneille reappeared upon the boards with a tragedy called epide more admired by his contemporaries than by posterity on the occasion of louis the fourteenth's marriage he wrote for the king's comedians the toisson d'or and put into the mouth of france those prophetic words quote, my natural force abates from long success alone triumphant blooms the state the wretched people groan their shrunken bodies bend beneath my high emprise whilst glory gilds the throne the subject sinks and dies End quote. sertorius appeared at the commencement of the year sixteen sixty two pray where did corneille learn politics and war asked turenne when he saw this piece played quote, you are the true and faithful interpreter of the mind and courage of rome balzac wrote to him quote, i say further sir you are often her teacher and the reformer of olden times if they have need of embellishment and support in the spots where rome is of brick you rebuild it of marble where you find a gap you fill it with a masterpiece and i take it that what you lend to history is always better than what you borrow from it quote, they are grander and more roman in his verses than in their history said la bruyere once only in the cid corneille had abandoned himself unreservedly to the reality of passion scared at what he might find in the weaknesses of the heart he would no longer see aught but its strength he sought in man that which resists and not that which yields thus giving his times the sublime pleasure of an enjoyment that can belong to naught but the human soul a cherished proof of its noble origin and its glorious destiny the pleasure of admiration the appreciation of the beautiful and the great the enthusiasm aroused by virtue he moves us at sight of a masterpiece thrills us at the sound of a noble deed enchants us at the bare idea of a virtue which three thousand years have forever separated from us corneille et son temps by m guizot every other thought every other prepossession are strangers to the poet his personages represent heroic passions which they follow out without swerving 
and without suffering themselves to be shackled by the notions of a morality which is still far from fixed and often in conflict with the interests and obligations of parties thus remaining perfectly of his own time and his own country all the while that he is describing greeks or romans or spaniards there is no pleasure in tracing the decadence of a great genius corneille wrote for a long while without success attributing his repeated rebuffs to his old age the influence of fashion the capricious taste of the generation for young people he thought himself neglected appealing to the king himself who had ordered cinna and pompey to be played at court Quote, go on the latest born have not degenerate not have they which would stamp them illegitimate they miserable fate were smothered at the birth and one kind glance of yours would bring them back to earth the people and the court i grant you cry them down i have or else they think i have too feeble grown i've written far too long to write so well again the wrinkles on the brow reach even to the brain but counter to this vote how many could i raise if to my latest works you should vouchsafe your praise how soon so kind a grace so potent to constrain would court and people both win back to me again so sophocles of yore at athens was the rage so boiled his ancient blood at fivescore years of age would they to envy cry when oedipus at bay before his judges stood and bore the votes away posterity has done for corneille more than louis the fourteenth could have done it has left in oblivion agesilas attila titus and pulcherie it preserved the memory of the triumphs only the poet was accustomed to say with a smile when he was reproached with his slowness and emptiness in conversation quote, i am peter corneille all the same end quote. the world has passed similar judgment on his works in spite of the rebuffs of his latter years he has remained quote, the great corneille end quote. When he died in 1684, Racine, elected by the Academy in 1673, found himself on the point of becoming its director. He claimed the honor of presiding at the obsequies of Corneille. The latter had not been admitted to the body until 1641, after having undergone two rebuffs. Corneille had died in the night. The Academy decided in favor of Abbé de Laveau, the outgoing director. Quote, Nobody but you could pretend to bury Corneille, said Ben Serrade to Racine, yet you have not been able to obtain the chance. End quote it was only when he received into the academy thomas corneille in his brother's place that racine could praise to his heart's content the master and rival who in old age had done him the honor to dread him quote, my father had not been happy in his speech at his own admission says louis racine ingenuously he was in this because he spoke out of the abundance of his heart being inwardly convinced that corneille was worth much more than he End quote. louis the fourteenth had come in for as great a share as corneille in racine's praises he informed of the success of the speech desired to hear it the author had the honor of reading it to him after which the king said to him quote, i am very pleased i would praise you more if you had praised me less End quote. it was on this occasion that the great arnaud still in disgrace and carefully concealed wrote to racine quote, i have to thank you sir for the speech which was sent me from you there certainly was never anything so eloquent and the hero whom you praise is so much the more worthy of your praises in that he considered them too great I have many things that I would say to you about that, if I had the pleasure of seeing you, but it would need the dispersal of a cloud which I dare to say is a spot upon this sun. I assure you that the ideas I have thereupon are not interested, and that what may concern myself affects me very little. A chat with you and your companion would give me much pleasure, but I would not purchase that pleasure by the least poltroonery. You know what I mean by that, and so I abide in peace and wait patiently for God to make known to this perfect prince that he has not in his kingdom a subject more loyal, more zealous for his true glory, and if I dare say so, loving him with a love more pure and more free from all interest. That is why I should not bring myself to take a single step to obtain liberty to see my friends, unless it were to my prince alone that I could be indebted for it." Fenelon and the great Arnaud held the same language, independent and submissive, proud and modest at the same time only their conscience spoke louder than their respect for the king at the time when racine was thus praising at the academy the king and the great corneille his own dramatic career was already ended he was born in sixteen thirty nine at la ferté milan he had made his first appearance on the stage in sixteen sixty four with the frère ennemi and had taken leave of it in sixteen seventy three with phedre esther and natalie played in sixteen eighty nine and sixteen ninety one by the young ladies of saint cyr were not regarded by their author and his austere friends as any derogation from the pious engagements he had entered into racine left an orphan at four years of age and brought up at port royal under the influence and the personal care of m le maitre who called him his son did not at first answer the expectations of his master 
the glowing fancy of which he already gave signs caused dismay to lancelot who threw into the fire one after the other two copies of the greek tale Théenne et chariclé which the young man was reading the third time the latter learnt it off by heart and taking the book to his severe censor quote, here said he you can burn this volume too as well as the others end quote. racine's pious friends had fine work to no purpose nature carried the day and he wrote verses quote, being unable to consult you i was prepared like malherbe to consult an old servant at our place he wrote to one of his friends if i had not discovered that she was a jansenist like her master and that she might betray me which would be my utter ruin considering that i receive every day letter upon letter or rather excommunication upon excommunication all because of a poor sonnet to deter the young man from poetry he was led to expect a benefice and was sent away to use to his uncles father sconet who set him to study theology quote, i pass my time with my uncle st thomas and virgil he wrote on the seventeenth of january sixteen sixty two to m vitard steward to the duke of luynes i make lots of extracts from theology and some from poetry my uncle has kind intentions towards me he hopes to get me something then i shall try to pay my debts i do not forget the obligations i am under to you i blush as i write erubuit puer salva rest est or the lad has blushed it is all right but that conclusion is all wrong my affairs do not mend end quote. racine had composed at use the frere ennemi which was played on his return to paris in sixteen sixty four not without a certain success alexandre met with a great deal in sixteen sixty five the author had at first entrusted it to moliere's company but he was not satisfied and gave his piece to the comedians of the hotel de dorgogne moliere was displeased and quarrelled with racine towards whom he had up to that time testified much good will the disagreement was not destined to disturb the equity of their judgments upon one another when racine brought out les plaideurs which was not successful at first moliere as he left said out loud quote, the comedy is excellent and they who deride it deserve to be derided End quote. one of racine's friends thinking to do him a pleasure went to him in all haste to tell him of the failure of the misanthrope at its first representation quote, the piece has fallen flat said he never was there anything so dull you can believe what i say for i was there quote, you were there and i was not replied racine and yet i do not believe it because it is impossible that moliere should have written a bad piece go again and pay more attention to it End quote. End of section seventy. Section seventy one of a popular history of France, volume five. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A popular history of France from the earliest times, volume five, by Francois Guizot, translated by Robert Black. Chapter forty eight. Louis the fourteenth. Literature and art. Part six racine had just brought out alexandre when he became connected with boileau who was three years his senior and who had already published several of his satires quote, i have a surprising facility in writing my verses said the young tragic author ingenuously quote, i want to teach you to write them with difficulty answered boileau and you have talent enough to learn before long End quote. andromaque was the result of this novel effort and was racine's real commencement he was henceforth irrevocably committed to the theatrical cause nicole attacking desmarets who had turned prophet after the failure of his clovis alluded to the author's comedies and exclaimed with all the severity of port royal quote, a romance writer and a scenic poet is a public poisoner not of bodies but of souls End quote. racine took these words to himself and he wrote in defence of the dramatic art two letters so bitter biting and insulting towards port royal and the protectors of his youth that boileau dissuaded him from publishing the second and that remorse before long took possession of his soul never to be entirely appeased he had just brought out les plaideurs which had been requested of him by his friends and partly composed during the dinners they frequently had together quote, i put into it only a few barbarous law terms which i might have picked up during a lawsuit and which neither i nor my judges ever really heard or understood End quote. after the first failure of the piece the king's comedians one day risked playing it before him quote, Louis the fourteenth was struck by it and did not think it a breach of his dignity or taste to utter shouts of laughter so loud that the courtiers were astounded End quote. the delighted comedians on leaving versailles returned straight to paris and went to awaken racine quote, three carriages during the night in a street where it was unusual to see a single one during the day woke up the neighbourhood there was a rush to the windows and as it was known that a councillor of requests or law officer had made a great uproar against the comedy of le plaideur nobody had a doubt of punishment befalling the poet who had dared to take off the judges in the open theatre next day all paris believed that he was in prison End quote. 
he had a triumph on the contrary with britannicus after which the king gave up dancing in the court ballets for fear of resembling nero berenice was a duel between corneille and racine for the amusement of madame henriette racine bore away the bell from his illustrious rival without much glory bajazet soon followed quote, here is racine's piece wrote madame de sevigny to her daughter in january sixteen seventy two if i could send you la chamelle you would think it good but without her it loses half its worth the character of bajazet is cold as ice the manners of the turks are ill observed in it they do not make so much fuss about getting married the catastrophe is not well led up to there are no reasons given for that great butchery there are some pretty things however but nothing perfectly beautiful nothing which carries by storm none of those bursts of corneilles which make one creep my dear let us be careful never to compare racine with him let us always feel the difference never will the former rise any higher than andromaque long live our old friend corneille let us forgive his bad verses for the sake of those divine and sublime beauties which transport us they are master strokes which are inimitable corneille had seen bajazet quote, i would take great care not to say so to anybody else he whispered in the ear of Sagret, who was sitting beside him, because they would say that I said so from jealousy, but, mind you, there is not in Bajazet a single character with the sentiments which should and do prevail at Constantinople. They have all, beneath a Turkish dress, the sentiments that prevail in the midst of France." The impassioned loyalty of Madame de Sévigny and the clear-sighted jealousy of Corneille were not mistaken. Bajazet is no Turk, but he is none the less very human. Quote, there are points by which men recognize themselves though there is no resemblance there are others in which there is resemblance without any recognition certain sentiments belong to nature in all countries they are characteristic of man only and everywhere man will see his own image in them corneille et son temps by m guizot racine's reputation went on continually increasing he had brought out mithridati and iphigenie phedra appeared in sixteen seventy seven a cabal of great lords caused its failure at first when the public, for a moment led astray after the Phèdre of Pradon, returned to the masterwork of Racine, vexation and wounded pride had done their office in the poet's soul. Pious sentiments ever smouldering in his heart, the horror felt for the theatre by Port Royal, and penitence for the sins he had been guilty of against his friends there, revived within him, and Racine gave up profane poetry for ever. The applause I have met with has often flattered me a great deal, said he at a later period to his son, but the smallest critical censure, bad as it may have been, always caused me more of vexation than all the praises have given me of pleasure. Racine wanted to turn Carthusian, his confessor dissuaded him, and his friends induced him to marry. Madame Racine was an excellent person, modest and devout, who never went to the theatre, and scarcely knew her husband's plays by name. She brought him some fortune. The king had given the great poet a pension and colbert had appointed him to the treasury or trésorier at moulins louis the fourteenth moreover granted frequent donations to men of letters racine received from him nearly fifty thousand livres he was appointed historiographer to the king boileau received the same title the latter was not married but racine before long had seven children Quote, why did not i turn carthusian he would sometimes exclaim in the disquietude of his paternal affection when his children were ill he devoted his life to them with pious solicitude, constantly occupied with their welfare, their good education, and the salvation of their souls. Several of his daughters became nuns. He feared above everything to see his eldest son devote himself to poetry, dreading for him the dangers he considered he himself had run. Quote, As for your epigram, I wish you had not written it, he wrote to him. Independently of its being commonplace, I cannot too earnestly recommend you not to let yourself give way to the temptation of writing French verses which would serve no purpose but to distract your mind. Above all, you should not write against anybody. This son, the object of so much care, to whom his father wrote such modest, grave, paternal, and sagacious letters, never wrote verses, lived in retirement, and died young without ever having married. Little Louis, or Léon Val, Racine's last child, was the only one who ever dreamed of being a writer. Quote, you must be very bold said boileau to him to dare write verses with the name you bear it is not that i consider it impossible for you to become capable some day of writing good ones but i mistrust what is without precedent and never since the world was world has there been seen a great poet's son of a great poet louis racine never was a great poet in spite of the fine verses which are to be met with in his poems la religion and la grace his memoir of his father written for his son describe racine in all the simple charm of his domestic life Quote, he would leave all to come and see us writes louis racine an equerry of the duke's came one day to say that he was expected to dinner at conde's house i shall not have the honour of going said he it is more than a week since i have seen my wife and children 
who are making holiday to-day to feast with me on a very fine carp. I cannot give up dining with them. And when the equerry persisted, he sent for the carp, which was worth about a crown. Judge for yourself, said he, whether I can disappoint these poor children who have made up their minds to regale me, and would not enjoy it if they were to eat this dish without me. He was loving by nature, adds Louis Racine, he was loving towards God when he returned to him, and from the day of his return to those who, from his infancy, had taught him to know him, he was so towards them without any reserve. He was so all his life towards his friends, towards his wife, and towards his children. Boileau had undertaken the task of reconciling his friend with Port Royal. Nicole had made no opposition, quote, not knowing what war was. End quote. M. Arnaud was intractable. Boileau one day made up his mind to take him a copy of Phèdre, pondering on the way as to what he should say to him. Quote, shall this man, said he, be always right, and shall I never be able to prove him wrong? I am quite sure that I shall be right to-day. If he is not of my opinion, he will be wrong. End quote. And going to M. Arnaud's, where he found a large company, he set about developing his thesis, pulling out Phèdre, and maintaining that if tragedy were dangerous, it was the fault of the poets. The younger theologians listened to him disdainfully, but at last M. Arnaud said out loud, quote, If things are as he says, he is right, and such tragedy is harmless. End quote. Boileau declared that he had never felt so pleased in his life. M. Arnaud being reconciled to Phèdre, the principal step was made. Next day the author of the tragedy presented himself. The culprit entered, humility and confusion depicted on his face. He threw himself at the feet of M. Arnaud, who took him in his arms. Racine was thenceforth received into favour by Port Royal. The two friends were preparing to set out with the king for the campaign of 1677. The besieged towns opened their gates before the poets had left Paris. Quote, How is it that you had not the curiosity to see a siege? The king asked them on his return. It was not a long trip. Quote, True, sir, answered Racine always the greater courtier of the two, but our tailors were too slow. We had ordered travelling suits, and when they were brought home, the places which your majesty was besieging were taken." Louis the Fourteenth was not displeased. Racine thenceforth accompanied him in all his campaigns. Boileau, who ailed a great deal, and was of shy disposition, remained at Paris. His friend wrote to him constantly, at one time from the camp, and at another from Versailles, whither he returned with the king. Quote, Madame de Maintenon told me this morning, writes Racine, that the king had fixed our pensions at four thousand francs for me and two thousand for you, that is, not including our literary pensions. I have just come from thanking the king. I laid more stress upon your case than even my own. I said in as many words, Sir, he has more wit than ever, more zeal for your majesty, and more desire to work for your glory than ever he had. I am nevertheless really pained at the idea of my getting more than you. But independently of the expenses and fatigue of the journeys, from which I am glad that you are delivered, I know that you are so noble-minded and so friendly that I am sure you would be heartily glad that I were even better treated. I shall be very pleased if you are." Boileau answered at once, quote, Are you mad with your compliments? Do not you know perfectly well that it was I who suggested the way in which things have been done? And can you doubt of my being perfectly well pleased with a matter in which I am accorded all I ask? Nothing in the world could be better, and I am even more rejoiced on your account than on my own." The two friends consulted one another mutually about their verses. Racine sent Boileau his spiritual songs. The king heard the Combat du Chrétien sung, set to music by Moreau. O oh God, my God, what deadly strife! Two men within myself I see. One would that, full of love to thee, my heart were leal in death and life. The other, with rebellion rife, against thy laws inciteth me. End quote. He turned to Madame de Maintenon, and quote, Madame, said he, I know those two men well. End quote. Boileau sends Racine his ode on the capture of Namur. Quote, I have risked some very new things, he says, even to speaking of the white plume which the king has in his hat. But, in my opinion, if you are to have novel expressions in verse, you must speak of things which have not been said in verse. You shall be judged with permission to alter the whole if you do not like it. End quote. Boileau's generous confidence was the more touching, in that Racine was sarcastic and bitter in discussion. Quote, Did you mean to hurt me? Boileau said to him one day. Quote, God forbid, was the answer. Quote, well, then, you made a mistake, for you did hurt me. End quote. Racine had just brought out Esther at the theatre of Saint Cyr. Madame de Brinon, lady superior of the establishment which was founded by Madame de Maintenon for the daughters of poor noblemen, had given her pupils a taste for theatricals. Quote, Our little girls have just been playing your Andromaque, wrote Madame de Maintenon to Racine, and they played it so well that they never shall play it again in their lives or any other of your pieces. End quote. She at the same time asked him to write, in his leisure hours, some sort of moral and historical poem from which love should be altogether banished. 
this letter threw Racine into a great state of commotion. He was anxious to please Madame de Maintenon, and yet it was a delicate commission for a man who had a great reputation to sustain. Boileau was for refusing. Quote, that was not in the calculations of Racine, says Madame de Caylus in her souvenir. He wrote Esther. Quote, Madame de Maintenon was charmed with the conception of the execution, says Madame de Lafayette. The play represented in some sort the fall of Madame de Montespan and her own elevation. All the difference was that Esther was a little younger, and less particular in the matter of piety. The way in which the characters were applied was the reason why Madame de Maintenon was not sorry to make public a piece which had been composed for the community only, and for some of her private friends. There was exhibited a degree of excitement about it which is incomprehensible. Not one of the small or the great but would go to see it, and that which ought to have been looked upon as merely a convent play became the most serious matter in the world. The ministers, to pay their court by going to this play, left their most pressing business. At the first representation at which the king was present, he took none but the principal officers of his hunt. The second was reserved for pious personages, such as Father Lachaise, and a dozen or fifteen Jesuits, with many other devotees of both sexes. Afterwards it extended to the courtiers. Quote, I paid my court at Saint-Cyr the other day more agreeably than I had expected, writes Madame de Sévigny to her daughter. Listened, Marshal Belfond and I, with an attention that was remarked, and with certain discreet commendations which were not perhaps to be found beneath the headdresses of all the ladies present. I cannot tell you how exceedingly delightful this piece is. It is a unison of music, verse, songs, persons, so perfect that there is nothing left to desire. The girls who act the kings and other characters were made expressly for it. Everything is simple, everything innocent, everything sublime and affecting. I was charmed, and so was the marshal, who left his place to go and tell the king how pleased he was, and that he sat beside a lady well worthy of having seen us there. The king came over to our seats. Madame, he said to me, I am assured that you have been pleased. I, without any confusion, replied, Sir, I am charmed. What I feel is beyond expression. The king said to me, Racine is very clever. I said to him, Very, sir, but really these young people are very clever, too. They throw themselves into the subject as if they had never done aught else. Ah, as to that, he replied, it is quite true. And then his majesty went away and left me the object of envy. The prince and princess came and gave me a word, Madame de Maintenon a glance. She went away with the king. I replied to all, for I was in luck. End quote. Atali had not the same brilliant success as Esther. The devotee and the envious had affrighted Madame de Maintenon, who had requested Racine to write it. The young ladies of Saint-Cyr, in the uniform of the house, played the piece quite simply at Versailles before Louis the Fourteenth and Madame de Maintenon, in a room without a stage. When the players gave a representation of it at Paris, it was considered heavy. It did not succeed. Racine imagined that he was doomed to another failure like that of Phèdre, which he preferred before all his other pieces. Quote, I am a pretty good judge, Boileau kept repeating to him. It is about the best you have done. The public will come round to it. End quote. Racine died before success was achieved by the only perfect piece which the French stage possesses, worthy both of the subject and of the sources whence Racine drew his inspiration. He had, with an excess of scrupulousness, abandoned the display of all the fire that burned within him. But beauty never ceased to rouse him to irresistible enthusiasm. Whilst reading the Psalms to M. de Seignelay, when lying ill, he could not refrain from paraphrasing them aloud. He admired Sophocles so much that he never dared touch the subjects of his tragedies. Quote, One day, says M. de Valicourt, when he was at Auteuil, at Boileau's, with M. Nicole and some distinguished friends, he took up a Sophocles in Greek and read the tragedy of Oedipus, translating it as he went. He read so feelingly that all his auditors experienced the sensations of terror and pity with which this piece abounds. I have seen our best pieces played by our best actors, but nothing ever came near the commotion into which I was thrown by this reading, and at this moment of writing I fancy I still see Racine, book in hand, and all of us awe-stricken around him." Thus it was that, whilst repeating but a short time before the verses of Mithridate as he was walking in the Tuileries, he had seen the workmen leaving their work and coming up to him, convinced as they were that he was mad, and was going to throw himself into the basin. End of section 71. Section 72 of A Popular History of France, Volume 5. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 5, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 48. Louis the Fourteenth, Literature and Art. Part 7. Racine for a long while enjoyed the favours of the king, who went so far as to tolerate the attachment the poet had always testified towards Port Royal. 
Racine, moreover, showed tact in humouring the susceptibilities of Louis XIV and his counsellors. Father Bonnour and Father Rapin, Jesuits, were in my study when I received your letter, he writes to Boileau. I read it to them on breaking the seal, and I gave them very great pleasure. I kept looking ahead, however, as I was reading, in case there was anything too Jansenistical in it. I saw towards the end the name of M. Nicole, and I skipped boldly, or rather mean-spiritedly, over it. I dared not expose myself to the chance of interfering with the great delight, and even shouts of laughter, caused them by many very amusing things you sent me. They are both of them, I assure you, very friendly towards you, and indeed very good fellows." All this caution did not prevent Racine, however, from displeasing the king. After a conversation he had held with Madame de Maintenon about the miseries of the people, she asked him for a memorandum on the subject. The king demanded the name of the author, and flew out at him. Quote, because he is a perfect master of verse, said he, does he think he knows everything? And because he is a great poet, does he want to be minister? End quote. Madame de Maintenon was more discreet in her relations with the king than bold in the defence of her friends. She sent Racine word not to come and see her until further orders. Quote, Let this cloud pass, she said, I will bring the fine weather back. End quote. Racine was ill, his naturally melancholy disposition had become sombre. Quote, I know, madame, he wrote to madame de Maintenon, what influence you have, but in the house of Port Royal I have an aunt who shows her affection for me in quite a different way. This holy woman is always praying God to send me disgraces, humiliations, and subjects for penitence. She will have more success than you. End quote. At bottom his soul was not sturdy enough to endure the rough doctrines of Port Royal. His health got worse and worse. He returned to court. He was readmitted by the king, who received him graciously. Racine continued uneasy. He had an abscess of the liver, and was a long while ill. Quote, when he was convinced that he was going to die, he ordered a letter to be written to the superintendent of finances, asking for payment, which was due, of his pension. His son brought him the letter. Why, said he, did you not ask for payment of Boileau's pension, too? We must not be made distinct. Write the letter over again, and let Boileau know that I was his friend even to death. When the latter came to wish him farewell, he raised himself up in bed with an effort. I regard it as a happiness for me to die before you, he said to his friend. An operation appeared necessary. His son would have given him hopes. And you, too, said Racine, you would do as the doctors and mock me. God is the master and can restore me to life, but death has sent in his bill. End quote. He was not mistaken. On the 21st of April, 1699, the great poet, the scrupulous Christian, the noble and delicate painter of the purest passions of the soul, expired at Paris at fifty-nine years of age, leaving life without regret, spite of all the successes with which he had been crowned. Unlike Corneille with the Cid, he did not take tragedy and glory by assault. He conquered them both by degrees, raising himself at each new effort, and gaining over, little by little, the most passionate admirers of his great rival. At the pinnacle of this reputation and this victory, at thirty-eight years of age, he had voluntarily shut the door against the intoxications and pride of success. He had mutilated his life, buried his genius in penitence, obeying simply the calls of his conscience, and with singular moderation in the very midst of exaggeration, becoming a father of a family and remaining a courtier, at the same time that he gave up the stage in glory. Racine was gentle and sensible even in his repentance and his sacrifices. Boileau gave religion the credit for this very moderation. Quote, reason commonly brings others to faith. It was faith which brought M. Racine to reason. End quote. Boileau had more to do with his friend's reason than he probably knew. Racine never acted without consulting him. With Racine, Boileau lost half his life. He survived him twelve years without ever setting foot again within the court after his first interview with the king. Quote, I have been at Versailles, he writes to his publisher, M. Brassette where I saw Madame de Maintenon, and afterwards the king, who overcame me with kind words. So here I am, more historiographer than ever. His Majesty spoke to me of M. Racine in a manner to make courtiers desire death, if they thought he would speak of them in the same way afterwards. Meanwhile that has been but very small consolation to me for the loss of that illustrious friend, who is none the less dead, though regretted by the greatest king in the universe. Quote, Remember, Louis the Fourteenth had said, that I have always an hour a week to give you when you like to come. End quote. Boileau did not go again. Quote, what should I go to court for? He would say, I cannot sing praises any more. At Racine's death, Boileau did not write any longer. He had entered the arena of letters at three and twenty after a sickly and melancholy childhood. The Art Poétique and the Lutrin appeared in 1674. The first nine satires and several of the epistles had preceded them. 
rather a witty shrewd and able versifier than a great poet boileau displayed in the lutrin a richness and suppleness of fancy which his other works had not foreshadowed the broad and cynical buffoonery of scarron's burlesques had always shocked his severe and pure taste Quote, your father was weak enough to read virgile travesti and laugh over it he would say to louis racine but he kept it dark from me in the lutrin boileau sought the gay and the laughable under noble and polished forms the gay lost by it the laughable remained stamped with an ineffaceable seal quote, m de pro wrote racine to his son has not only received from heaven a marvellous genius for satire but he has also together with that an excellent judgment which makes him discern what needs praise and what needs blame this marvellous genius for satire did not spoil boileau's natural good feeling quote, he is cruel in verse only madame de sevigny used to say racine was tart bitter in discussion boileau always preserved his coolness his judgments frequently anticipated those of posterity the king asked him one day who was the greatest poet of his reign quote, moliere sir answered boileau without hesitation quote, i shouldn't have thought it rejoined the king somewhat astonished but you know more about it than i do End quote. moliere in his turn defending la fontaine against the pleasantries of his friends said to his neighbour at one of those social meals in which the illustrious friends delighted quote, let us not laugh at the good soul or bonhomme he will probably live longer than the whole of us End quote in the noble and touching brotherhood of these great minds boileau continued invariably to be the bond between the rivals intimate friend as he was of racine he never quarrelled with moliere and he hurried to the king to beg that he would pass on the pension with which he honoured him to the aged corneille groundlessly deprived of the royal favours he entered the academy on the third of july sixteen eighty four immediately after la fontaine his satires had retarded his election quote, he praised without flattery he humbled himself nobly says louis racine and when he said that admission to the academy was sure to be closed against him for so many reasons he set a-thinking all the academicians he had spoken ill of in his work he was no longer writing verses when perrault published his parallel des anciens et des modernes quote, if boileau do not reply said the prince of conti you may assure him that i will go to the academy and write on his chair brutus thou sleepest End quote the ode on the capture of namur intended to crush perrault whilst celebrating pindar not being sufficient boileau wrote his reflexions sur longuin bitter and often unjust towards perrault who was far more equitably treated and more effectually refuted in fenelon's letter to the french academy boileau was by this time old he had sold his house at auteuil which was so dear but he did not give up literature continuing to revise his verses carefully preoccupied with new editions and reproaching himself for this preoccupation Quote, it is very shameful he would say to be still busying myself with rhymes and all those parnasian trifles when i ought to be thinking of nothing but the account i am prepared to go and render to god End quote. he died on the thirteenth of march seventeen eleven leaving nearly all he had to the poor he was followed to the tomb by a great throng quote, he had many friends was the remark amongst the people and yet we are assured that he spoke evil of everybody End quote. no writer ever contributed more than boileau to the formation of poetry no more correct or shrewd judgment ever assessed the merits of authors no loftier spirit ever guided a stronger and a juster mind through all the vicissitudes undergone by literature in spite of the sometimes excessive severity of his decrees boileau has left an ineffaceable impression upon the french language his talent was less effective than his understanding his judgment and his character have had more influence than his verses boileau had survived all his friends la fontaine born in sixteen twenty one at chateau thierry had died in sixteen ninety five he had entered in his youth the brotherhood of the oratory which he had soon quitted being unable he used to say to accustom himself to theology he went and came between town and town amusing himself everywhere and already writing a little Quote, for me the whole round world was laden with delights my heart was touched by flower sweet sound and sunny day i was the sot of friends and eke of lady gay End quote fontaine was married without caring much for his wife whom he left to live alone at chateau thierry he was in great favour with fouquet when his patron was disgraced in danger of his life la fontaine put into the mouth of the nymphs of vaux his touching appeal to the king's clemency Quote, may he then o'er the life of high-souled henry poor who with the power to take for vengeance yearned no more o oh, into louis's soul this gentle spirit breathe End quote later on during fouquet's imprisonment at pignerol la fontaine wrote further quote, i sigh to think upon the object of my prayers you take my sense ariste 
Your generous nature shares the plaints I make for him who so unkindly fares. He did displease the king, and lo, his friends were gone. Forthwith a thousand throats roared out at him like one. I wept for him despite the torrent of his foes. I taught the world to have some pity for his woes. End quote. La Fontaine has been described as a solitary being, without wit and without external charm of any kind. La Bruyere has said, quote, A certain man appears loutish, heavy, stupid. He can neither talk nor relate what he has just seen. He sets himself to writing, and it is a model of story-telling. He makes speakers of animals, trees, stones, everything that cannot speak. There is nothing but lightness and elegance, nothing but natural beauty and delicacy in his works. Quote, he says nothing or will talk of nothing but Plato, Racine's daughters used to say. All his contemporaries, however, of fashion and good breeding, did not form the same opinion of him. The dowager duchess of Orléans, Marguerite of Lorraine, had taken him as one of her gentlemen-in-waiting. The duchess of Bouillon had him in her retinue in the country. Madame de Montespan and her sister, Madame de Tiange, liked to have a visit from him. He lived at the house of Madame de la Sablière, a beauty and a wit, who received a great deal of company. He said of her, quote, warm is her heart and knit with tenderest ties to those she loves and elsewise otherwise for such a sprite whose birthplace is the skies of manly beauty blent with woman's grace no mortal pen though fain can fitly trace quote. Quote, i have only kept by me she would say my three pets or animaux my dog my cat and la fontaine end quote. when she died m and madame d'ervard received into their house the now old and somewhat isolated poet as Dervas was on his way to go and make the proposal to La Fontaine, he met him in the street. Quote, I was coming to ask you to put up at our house, said he. Quote, I was just going thither, answered Fontaine with the most touching confidence. There he remained to his death, contenting himself with going now and then to Chateau Thierry, as long as his wife lived, to sell, with her consent, some strip of ground. The property was going, old age was coming. Quote, John did no better than he had begun, spent property and income both as one of treasure saw small use in any way knew very well how to get through his day split it in two one part as he thought best he passed in sleep did nothing all the rest he did not sleep he dreamed one day dinner was kept waiting for him quote, i have just come said he as he entered from the funeral of an aunt i followed the procession to the cemetery and i escorted the family home it has been said that la fontaine knew nothing of natural history he knew and loved animals up to his time, fable-writers had been merely philosophers or satirists. He was the first who was a poet, unique not only in France but in Europe, discovering the deep and secret charm of nature, animating it with his inexhaustible and graceful genius, giving lessons to men from the example of animals, without making the latter speak like man. Ever supple and natural, sometimes elegant and noble, with penetration beneath the cloak of his simplicity, inimitable in the line which he had chosen from taste, from instinct, and not from want of power to transport his genius elsewhither. He himself has said, quote, Yes, call me truly, if it must be said, Parnasian butterfly, and like the bees wherein old Plato found our similes. Light rover I, forever on the wing, flutter from flower to flower, from thing to thing, with much of pleasure mix a little fame. End quote and in psyche, quote, music and books, and junketings and love, and town and country, all to me is bliss. There nothing is that comes amiss, in melancholy's self-grim joy I prove, end quote. The grace, the naturalness, the original independence of the mind and the works of La Fontaine had not the luck to please Louis the Fourteenth, who never accorded him any favour, and La Fontaine did not ask for any, quote, all dumb I shrink once more within my shell, where unobtrusive pleasures dwell, True, I shall here by fortune be forgot, her favours with my verse agree not well, to importune the gods beseems me not. End quote. Once only, from the time of Fouquet's trial, the poet demanded a favour. Louis the Fourteenth, having misgivings about the propriety of the Comte of La Fontaine, had not yet given the assent required for his election to the French Academy, when he set out for the campaign in Luxembourg. La Fontaine addressed to him a ballad. Quote, just as in Homer Jupiter we see alone or all the other gods prevail. You, one against a hundred though it be, balance all Europe in the other scale. Them like an eye to those who in the tale mountain on mountain piled, presumptuously warring with heaven and Jove. The earth clave he, and hurled them down beneath huge rocks to wail. So take you up your bolt with energy, a happy consummation cannot fail. Sweet thought that doth this month or two avail to somewhat soothe my muse's anxious care. 
for certain minds at certain stories rail certain poor jests which naught but trifles are if i with deference their lessons hail what would they more be you more prone to spare more kind than they less sheathed in rigorous mail prince in a word your real self declare a happy consummation cannot fail the election of boileau to the academy appeased the king's humour who preferred the other's intellect to that of la fontaine quote, the choice you have made of m despreaux is very gratifying to me he said to the board of the academy it will be approved of by everybody you can admit la fontaine at once he has promised to be good it was a rash promise which the poet did not always keep the friends of la fontaine had but lately wanted to reconcile him to his wife they had with that view sent him to chateau thierry he returned without having seen her whom he went to visit quote, my wife was not at home said he she had gone to the sacrament or salut end quote. he was becoming old those same faithful friends racine boileau and maucroix were trying to bring him home to god racine took him to church with him a testament was given him quote, that is a very good book said he i assure you it is a very good book end quote. then all at once addressing abbe boileau quote, doctor do you think that St. Augustin was as clever as Rabelais? End quote. He was ill, however, and began to turn towards eternity his dreamy and erratic thoughts. He had set about composing pious hymns. Quote, the best of thy friends has not a fortnight to live, he wrote to Maucroix. For two months I have not been out, unless to go to the academy for amusement. Yesterday, as I was returning, I was seized in the middle of Rue du Chantre with a fit of such great weakness that I really thought I was dying. Oh, my dear friend, to die is nothing, but thinkest thou that I am about to appear before God? Thou knowest how I have lived. Before thou hast this letter, the gates of eternity will perchance be opened for me. Quote. Quote, he is as simple as a child, said the woman who took care of him in his last illness. If he has done amiss, it was from ignorance rather than wickedness. A charming and a curious being, serious and simple, profound and childlike, winning by reason of his very vagaries his good-natured originality his helplessness in common life la fontaine knew how to estimate the literary merits as well as the moral qualities of his illustrious friends quote, when they happened to be together says he in his tale of psyche and had talked to their hearts content of their diversions if they chanced to stumble upon any point of science or literature they profited by the occasion without however lingering too long over one and the same subject but flitting from one topic to another like bees that meet as they go with different sorts of flowers envy malignity or cabal had no voice amongst them they adored the works of the ancients refused not the moderns the praises which were their due spoke of their own with modesty and gave one another honest advice when any one of them fell ill of the malady of the age and wrote a book which happened now and then in this case acanthus or racine did not fail to propose a walk in some place outside the town in order to hear the reading with less noise and more pleasure he was extremely fond of gardens flowers foliage folifil or la fontaine resembled him in this but then folifil might be said to love all things both of them were lyrically inclined with this difference that acanthus was rather the more pathetic polyphile the more ornate when la fontaine died on the thirteenth of april sixteen ninety five of the four friends lately assembled at versailles to read the tale of psyche moliere alone had disappeared la fontaine had admired at vaux the young comic poet who had just written the facheux for the entertainment given by fouquet to louis the fourteenth it is a work by moliere this writer of a style so rare is nowadays the court's delight his fame so rapid is its flight beyond the bounds of rome must be amen for he's the man for me in his old age he gave vent to his grief and his regret at Moliere's death in this touching epitaph, quote, Beneath this stone Plautus and Terence lie, though lieth here but Moliere alone, their threefold gifts of mind made up but one, that witched all France with noble comedy, now are they gone, and little hope have I that we again shall look upon the three dead men, methinks while countless years roll by, Terentius, Plautus, Moliere will be, end, quote. end of section 72. Section seventy three of a popular history of France, volume five. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A popular history of France from the earliest times, volume five, by Francois Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter forty eight. Louis the fourteenth. Literature and art. Part eight. Moliere and French comedy had no need to take shelter beneath the mantle of the ancients. They, together, had shed upon the world incomparable lustre. Shakespeare might dispute with Corneille and Racine the sceptre of tragedy. 
he had succeeded in showing himself as full of power with more truth as the one and as full of tenderness with more profundity as the other moliere is superior to him in originality abundance and perfection of characters he yields to him neither in range nor penetration nor complete knowledge of human nature the lives of these two great geniuses authors and actors both together present in other respects certain features of resemblance both were intended for another career than that of the stage both carried away by an irresistible passion assembled about them a few actors leading at first a roving life to end by becoming the delight of the court and of the world john baptist poquelin who before long assumed the name of moliere was born at paris in sixteen twenty two his father upholstery groom of the chamber or valet de chambre tapissier to louis the fourteenth had him educated with some care at clermont afterwards louis le grand college then in the hands of the jesuits he attended by favour the lessons which the philosopher gassendi for a long time the opponent of descartes gave young chapelle he imbibed at these lessons together with a more extensive course of instruction a certain freedom of thinking which frequently cropped out in his plays and contributed later on to bring upon him an accusation of irreligion in sixteen forty five or possibly sixteen forty three moliere had formed with the ambitious title of illustre theatre a small company of actors who being unable to maintain themselves at paris for a long while tramped the provinces through all the troubles of the fronde it was in sixteen fifty three that moliere brought out at lyon his comedy L'Étourdi, the first regular piece he had ever composed the dépit amoureux was played at beziers in sixteen fifty six at the opening of the session of the states of languedoc the company returned to paris in sixteen fifty eight in sixteen fifty nine moliere who had obtained a license from the king gave at his own theatre les précieuses ridicules he broke with all imitation of the italians and the spaniards and taking off to the life the manners of his own times he boldly attacked the affected exaggeration and absurd pretensions of the vulgar imitators of the hôtel de rambouillet Quote, bravo moliere cried an old man from the middle of the pit this is real comedy End quote. when he published his piece moliere anxious not to give umbrage to a powerful clique took care to say in his preface that he was not attacking real précieuses but only the bad imitations just as he had recalled corneille to the stage fouquet was for protecting moliere upon it the école des mans and the facheux were played at vaux amongst the ridiculous characters in this latter moliere had not described the huntsman louis the fourteenth himself indicated to him the marquis of soyecourt there's one you have forgotten he said twenty-four hours later the bore of a huntsman with all his jargon of venery had a place forever amongst the facheux of moliere the école des femmes the impromptu de versailles the critique de l'école des femmes began a bellicose period in the great comic poet's life accused of impiety attacked in the honour of his private life moliere returning insult for insult delivered over those amongst his enemies who offered a butt for ridicule to the derision of the court and of posterity the festin de pierre and the signal punishment of the libertine or free thinker were intended to clear the author from the reproach of impiety la princesse de lide and l'amour médecin were but charming interludes in the great struggle henceforth instituted between reality and appearance in sixteen sixty six moliere produced le misanthrope a frank and noble spirit sublime invective against the frivolity perfidious and showy semblances of court Quote, this misanthrope's despitefulness against bad verses was copied from me moliere himself confessed as much to me many a time wrote boileau one day the indignation of alceste is deeper and more universal than that of boileau against bad poets he is disgusted with the court and the world because he is honest virtuous and sincere and sees corruption triumphant around him he is wroth to feel the effects of it in his life and almost in his soul he is a victim to the eternal struggle between good and evil without the strength and the unquenchable hope of christianity the misanthrope is a shriek of despair uttered by virtue excited and almost distraught at the defeat she forebodes the tartuffe was a new effort in the same direction and bolder in that it attacked religious hypocrisy and seemed to aim its blows even at religion itself moliere was a long time working at it the first acts had been played in sixteen sixty four at court under the title of l'hypocrite at the same time as la princesse de lide quote, the king says the account of the entertainment in the gazette de lorraine saw so much analogy of form between those whom true devotion sets in the way of heaven and those whom an empty ostentation of good deeds does not hinder from committing bad that his extreme delicacy in respect of religious matters could with difficulty brook this resemblance of vice to virtue 
and though there might be no doubt of the author's good intentions, he prohibited the playing of this comedy before the public until it should be quite finished and examined by persons qualified to judge of it, so as not to let advantage be taken of it by others less capable of just discernment in the matter. End quote. Though played once publicly, in 1667, under the title of L'Imposteur, the piece did not appear definitively on the stage until 1669, having undoubtedly excited more scandal by interdiction than it would have done by representation. The king's good sense and judgment at last prevailed over the terrors of the truly devout and the resentment of hypocrites. He had just seen an impious piece of buffoonery played, quote, i should very much like to know said he to the prince of conde who stood up for moliere an old fellow-student of his brother's the prince of conti's why people who are so greatly scandalized at moliere's comedy say nothing about scaramouche quote, the reason of that answered the prince is that scaramouche makes fun of heaven and religion about which those gentry do not care and that moliere makes fun of their own selves which they cannot brook End quote. the prince might have added that all the blows in tartuffe a masterpiece of shrewdness, force, and fearless and deep wrath, struck home at hypocrisy. Whilst waiting for permission to have Tartuffe played, Molière had brought out Le Médecin Malgré Lui, L'Amphitryon, Georges Dandin, and Lavard, lavishing freely upon them the inexhaustible resources of his genius, which was ever ready to supply the wants of kingly and princely entertainments. M. de Porsognac was played for the first time at Chambord on the 6th of October, 1669. A year afterwards, on the same stage, appeared Le Bourgeois Gentilhomme, with the interludes and music of Lully. The piece was a direct attack upon one of the most frequent absurdities of his day. Many of the courtiers felt in their hearts that they were attacked. There was a burst of wrath at the first representation, by which the king had not appeared to be struck. Moliere thought it was all over with him. Louis the Fourteenth desired to see the piece a second time. Quote, "'You have never written anything yet which has amused me so much. Your comedy is excellent,' said he to the poet. The court was at once seized with a fit of admiration. The king had lavished his benefits upon Molière, who had an hereditary post near him as groom of the chamber. He had given him a pension of seven thousand livres, and the license of the king's theatre. He had been pleased to stand godfather to one of his children, to whom the Duchess of Orléans was godmother. He had protected him against the superciliousness of certain servants of his bedchamber, but all the monarch's puissance and constant favours could not obliterate public prejudice, and give the comedian whom they saw every day on the boards the position and rank which his genius deserved. Molière's friends urged him to give up the stage. Quote, "'Your health is going,' Boileau would say to him, "'because the duties of a comedian exhaust you. Why not give it up?' Quote, "'Alas,' replied Molière with a sigh, "'it is a point of honour that prevents me.' Quote, "'A what?' rejoined Boileau, what, to smear your face with a moustache as Scannarelle, and come on the stage to be thrashed with a stick? That is a pretty point of honour for a philosopher like you." Molière might probably have followed the advice of Boileau, he might probably have listened to the silent warnings of his failing powers, if he had not been unfortunate and sad. Unhappy in his marriage, justly jealous and yet passionately fond of his wife, without any consolation within him against the bitternesses and vexations of his life, he sought in work and incessant activity the only distractions which had any charm for a high spirit constantly wounded in its affections and its legitimate pride psyche les fourberies de scapin la comtesse d'escarbagna betrayed nothing of their author's increasing sadness or suffering les femmes savantes had at first but little success the piece was considered heavy the marvellous nicety of the portraits the correctness of the judgments the delicacy and elegance of the dialogue were not appreciated until later on Molière had just composed Le Malade Imaginaire, the last of that succession of blows which he had so often dealt the doctors. He was more ailing than ever. His friends, even his actors themselves, pressed him not to have any play. Quote, what would you have me do? he replied. There are fifty poor workmen who have but their day's pay to live upon. What will they do if we have no play? I should reproach myself with having neglected to give them bread for one single day if I could really help it. End quote. Molière had a bad voice, a disagreeable hiccup and harsh inflections. Quote, he was nevertheless, say his contemporaries, a comedian from head to foot. He seemed to have several voices, everything about him spoke, and by a caper, by a smile, by a wink of the eye and a shake of the head, he conveyed more than the greatest speaker could have done by talking in an hour. End quote. He played as usual on the 17th of February, 1673. The curtain had risen exactly at four o'clock. Molière could hardly stand, and he had a fit during the burlesque ceremony, at the end of the play, whilst pronouncing the word juro. He was icy cold when he went back to Baron's box, who was waiting for him, who saw him home to Rue Richelieu, and who at the same time sent for his wife and two sisters of charity. 
When he went up again with Madame Molière into the room, the great comedian was dead. He was only fifty-one. It has been a labour of love to go into some detail over the lives, works, and characters of the great writers during the age of Louis the Fourteenth. They did too much honour to their time and their country. They had too great and too deep an effect in France and in Europe upon the successive developments of the human intellect to refuse them an important place in the history of that France to whose influence and glory they so powerfully contributed. Molière did not belong to the French Academy. His profession had shut the doors against him. It was nearly a hundred years after his death, in 1778, that the Academy raised to him a bust beneath which was engraved, quote, Oh, his glory lacks not, ours did lack him. End quote. It was by instinct and of its own free choice that the French Academy had refused to elect a comedian. It had grown, and its liberty had increased under the sway of Louis the Fourteenth. In 1672, at the death of Chancellor Seguier, who had become its protector after Richelieu, quote, it was so honoured that the king was graciously pleased to take upon himself this office. The body had gone to thank him. His majesty desired that the Dauphin should be witness of what passed on an occasion so honourable to literature. After the speech of M. Arlet, Archbishop of Paris, and the man in France with most inborn talent for speaking, the king, appearing somewhat touched, gave the academicians very great marks of esteem, inquired the names, one after another, of those whose faces were not familiar to him, who was there in his capacity of simple academician. You will let me know what I must do for these gentlemen. Perhaps M. Colbert, that minister who was so zealous for the fine arts, never received an order more in conformity with his own inclinations. From that time the French Academy held its sittings at the Louvre, and as regarded complimentary addresses to the king on state occasions, it took rank with the sovereign bodies. For thirty-five years the Academy had been working at its dictionnaire. From the first the work had appeared interminable. Quote, These six years past they toil at letter F, and I'd be much obliged if destiny would whisper to me, Thou shalt live to G, wrote Bois-Robert to Balzac. The Academy had entrusted Vaugelas with the preparatory labour. It was, says Pellisson, the only way of coming quickly to an end. end quote. A pension, which he had not been paid for a long time past, was revived in his favour. Vaugelas took his plan to Cardinal Richelieu. Quote, well, sir, said the minister, smiling with a somewhat contemptuous air of kindness, you will not forget the word pension in this dictionary. Quote, no, Monseigneur, replied M. de Vaugelas, with a profound bow, and still less reconnaissance, or gratitude. End quote. Vaugelas had finished the first volume of his Remarques sur la langue française, which has ever since remained the basis of all works on grammar. Quote, he had imported into the body of the work a something or other so estimable, or d'honnête homme, and so much frankness that one could scarcely help loving its author. He was working at the second volume when he died, in 1649, so poor that his creditors seized his papers, making it very difficult for the Academy to recover his memoir. The dictionary, having lost its principal author, went on so slowly that Colbert, curious to know whether the academicians honestly earned their modest medals for attendance, or jetons de présence, which he had assigned to them, came one day unexpectedly to a sitting. He was present at the whole discussion, quote, after which, having seen the attention and care which the academy was bestowing upon the composition of its dictionary, he said, as he rose, that he was convinced that it could not get on any faster and his evidence ought to be of so much more the weight in that never man in his position was more laborious or more diligent. End, quote. End of section 73section 74 of a popular history of France, volume 5. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A popular history of France from the earliest times, volume 5, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 48 Louis the Fourteenth, Literature and Art, Part Nine. The academicians who were men of letters worked at the dictionary. The academicians who were men of fashion had become pretty numerous. Arnaud d'Andilly and M. de Lamoignon, whom the body had honoured by election, declined to join, and the academy resolved to never elect anybody without a previously expressed desire and request. At the time when M. de Lamoignon declined, the kin, fearing that it might bring the academy into some disfavour, procured the appointment in his stead of the coadjutor of Strasbourg, Armand de Rouen Soubise. Quote, Splendid as your triumph may be, wrote Boileau to M. de Lamoignon, I am persuaded, sir, from what I know of your noble and modest character, that you are very sorry to have caused this displeasure to a body which is after all very illustrious, and that you will attempt to make it manifest to all the earth. I am quite willing to believe that you had good reasons for acting as you have done. End quote. 
the academy from that moment regarded the title it conferred as irrevocable it did not fill up the place of the abbe de st pierre when it found itself obliged to exclude him from its sittings by order of louis the fifteenth it did not fill up the place of monseigneur du Loup when he thought proper to send in his resignation in spite of court intrigues it from that moment maintained its independence and its dignity Quote, m despreaux writes the banker le verrier to the duke of noailles represented to the academy with a great deal of heat that all was rack and ruin since it was nothing more but a cabal of women that put academicians in the place of those who died then he read out loud some verses by m de saint hollaire thus m despreaux before the eyes of everybody gave m de saint hollaire a black ball and nominated all by himself m de mimur here, Monseigneur, is proof that there are Romans still in the world, and for the future I will trouble you to call M. Despreaux no longer your dear poet, but your dear Cato. With his extreme deafness, Boileau had great difficulty in fulfilling his academic duties. He was a member of the Academy of Medals and Inscriptions, founded by Colbert in 1662, quote, in order to render the acts of the king immortal by deciding the legends of the medals struck in his honour. Pontchartrain raised to forty the number of the members of the Petite Académie, extended its functions, and entrusted it thenceforth with the charge of publishing curious documents relating to the history of France. Quote, we had read to us today a very learned work, but rather tiresome, says Boileau to M. Pontchartrain, and we were bored right eruditely. But afterwards there was an examination of another which was much more agreeable, and the reading of which attracted considerable attention. As the reader was put quite close to me, I was in a position to hear and to speak of it, all I ask you to complete the measure of your kindnesses is to be kind enough to let everybody know that, if I am of so little use at the Academy of Medals, it is equally true that I do not, and do not wish to obtain, any pecuniary advantage from it." The Academy of Sciences had already for many years had sittings in one of the rooms of the King's Library. Like the French Academy, it had owed its origin to private meetings at which Descartes, Gassendi, and young Pascal were accustomed to be present. Quote, there are in the world scholars of two sorts said a note sent to colbert about the formation of the new academy one give themselves up to science because it is a pleasure to them they are content as the fruit of their labours with the knowledge they acquire and if they are known it is only amongst those with whom they converse unambitiously and for mutual instruction these are bona fide scholars whom it is impossible to do without in a design so great as that of the academie royale there are others who cultivate science only as a field which is to give them sustenance and as they see by experience that great rewards fall only to those who make the most noise in the world they apply themselves especially not to making new discoveries for hitherto that has not been recompensed but to whatever may bring them into notice these are scholars of the fashionable world and such as one knows best colbert had the true scholar's taste he had brought cassini from italy to take the direction of the new observatory he had ordered surveys for a general map of france he had founded the journal des savants Literary men, whether Frenchmen or foreigners, enjoyed the king's bounties. Colbert had even conceived the plan of a universal academy, a veritable forerunner of the institute. The arts were not forgotten in this grand project. The academy of painting and sculpture dated from the regency of Anne of Austria. The pretensions of the masters of arts, or maîtres des arts, who placed an interdict upon artists not belonging to their corporation, had driven Charles Lebrun, himself the son of a master, to agitate for its foundation. Colbert added to it the Academy of Music and the Academy of Architecture, and created the French School of Painting at Rome. Beside the palace, for a long time past dedicated to this establishment, lived for more than thirty-five years Le Poussin, the first and the greatest of all the painters of that French school which was beginning to spring up, whilst the Italian school, though blooming still in talent and strength, was forgetting more and more every day the nobleness, the purity, and the severity of taste which had carried to the highest pitch the art of the fifteenth century the tradition of the masters in vogue in italy of the caracci of guido of paul veronese had reached paris with simon vouet who had long lived at rome he was succeeded there by a frenchman quote, whom from his grave and thoughtful air you would have taken for a father of sorbonne says m vitet in his charming vie de la sueur quote, his black eye beneath his thick eyebrow nevertheless flashed forth a glance full of poesy and youth his manner of living was not less surprising than his personal appearance he might be seen walking in the streets of rome tablets in hand hitting off by a stroke or two of his pencil at one time the antique fragments he came upon at another the gestures the attitudes the faces of the persons who presented themselves in his path sometimes in the morning he would sit on the terrace of trinity del monte 
beside another Frenchman five or six years younger, but already known for rendering landscapes with such fidelity, such fresh and marvellous beauty, that all the Italian masters gave place to him, and that after two centuries he has not yet met his rival. End quote. Quote, of these two artists, the older evidently exercised over the other the superiority which genius has over talent. The smallest hints of Le Poussin were received by Claude Lorrain with deference and respect, and yet, to judge from the prices at which they severally sold their pictures, the landscape painter had for the time an indisputable superiority. Claude Gelet, called Lorrain, had fled when quite young from the shop of the confectioner with whom his parents had placed him. He had found means of getting to Rome. There he worked there he lived and there he died returning but once to france in the height of his renown for just a few months without even enriching his own land with any great number of his works nearly all of them remained on foreign soil le poussin born at andelys in fifteen ninety three made his way with great difficulty to italy he was by that time thirty years old and had no more desire than claude to return to france where painting was with difficulty beginning to obtain a standing his reputation however had penetrated thither king louis the thirteenth was growing weary of simon vouet's factitious lustre he wanted le poussin to go to paris the painter for a long while held out the king insisted quote, i shall go said le poussin like one sentence to be sawn in halves and severed in twain end quote. he passed eighteen months in france welcomed enthusiastically lodged at the tuileries magnificently paid but exposed to the jealousies of simon vouet and his pupils worried thwarted frozen to death by the hoar-frosts of paris he took the road back to rome in november sixteen forty two on the pretext of going to fetch his wife and did not return any more he had left in france some of his masterpieces models of that new independent and conscientious art faithfully studied from nature in all its italian grandeur and from the treasures of the antique quote, how did you arrive at such perfection people would ask le poussin quote, by neglecting nothing the painter would say in the same way newton was soon to discover the great laws of the physical world quote, by always thinking thereon end quote. during le poussin's stay at paris he had taken as a pupil eustache le sueur who had been trained in the studio of simon vouet but had been struck from the first with the incomparable genius and proud independence of the master sent to him by fate alone he had supported le poussin in his struggle against the envious alone he entered upon the road which revealed itself to him whilst he studied under le poussin he was poor he had great difficulty in managing to live the delicacy the purity the suavity of his genius could shine forth in their entirety nowhere but in the convent of the carthusians whose cloister he was commissioned to decorate there he painted the life of st bruno breathing into this almost mystical work all the religious poetry of his soul and of his talent ever delicate and chaste even in the allegorical figures of mythology with which he before long adorned the hotel lambert he had returned to his favourite pursuits, embellishing the churches of Paris with incomparable works, when overwhelmed by the loss of his wife, and exhausted by the painful efforts of his genius, he died at thirty-seven, in that convent of the Carthusians which he glorified with his talent, at the same time that he edified the monks with his religious zeal. Le Sueur succumbed in a struggle too rude and too rough for his pure and delicate nature. Le Brun had returned from that Italy which Le Sueur had never been able to reach. The old rivalry, fostered in the studio of Simon Vouet, was already being renewed between the two artists. The angelic art gave place to the worldly and the earthly. Le Sueur died. Le Brun found himself master of the position, assured by anticipation, and as it were by instinct, of sovereign dominion under the sway of the young king for whom he had been created. Old Philip of Champagne alone might have disputed with him the foremost rank. He had passionately admired Le Poussin. He had attached himself to Le Sueur. Quote, Never, says M. Vitet, had he sacrificed to fashion, never had he fallen into the vagaries of the degenerate Italian style. End quote. This upright, simple, painstaking soul, this inflexible conscience, looking continually into the human face, had preserved in his admirable portraits the life and the expression of nature which he was incessantly trying to seize and reproduce. Le Brun was preferred to him as the first painter to the king by Louis the Fourteenth himself. Philip of Champagne was delighted thereat. He lived in retirement, in fidelity to his friends of Port Royal, whose austere and vigorous lineaments he loved to trace, beginning with M. de saint Cyran and ending with his own daughter, Sister Suzanne, who was restored to health by the prayers of Mother Agnes Arnaud. Le Brun was as able a courtier as he was a good painter. The clever arrangement of his pictures, the richness and brilliancy of his talent, his faculty for applying art to industry, secured him with Louis the Fourteenth a sway which lasted as long as his life. He was first painter to the king. He was director of the Gobelins and of the Academy of Painting. 
quote, he let nothing be done by the other artists but according to his own designs and suggestions. The worker in tapestry, the decorative painter, the statuary, the goldsmith, took their models from him. All came from him, all flowed from his brain, all bore his imprint, end quote. The painter followed the king's ideas, being entirely after his own heart. For fourteen years he worked for Louis Fourteenth, representing his life and his conquests at Versailles, painting for the Louvre the victories of Alexander, which were engraved almost immediately by Audrin and Edelink. He was jealous of the royal favour, sensitive and haughty towards artists, honestly concerned for the king's glory and for the tasks confided to himself. The growing reputation of Mignard, whom Louvois had brought back from Rome, troubled and disquieted Lebrun. In vain did the king encourage him. Lebrun, already ill, said in the presence of Louis the Fourteenth that fine pictures seemed to become finer after the painter's death. Quote, Do not you be in a hurry to die, Monsieur Lebrun, said the king. We esteem your pictures now quite as highly as posterity can. End quote. The small gallery at Versailles had been entrusted to Mignard. Lebrun withdrew to Montmorency, where he died in 1690, jealous of Mignard at the end as he had been of Le Soir at the outset of his life. Mignard became first painter to the king. He painted the ceiling of Val de Grasse, which was celebrated by Molière, but it was as a painter of portraits that he excelled in France. Quote, M. Mignard does them best, said Le Poussin not long before, with lofty good nature, though his heads are all paint, without force or character. End quote. To Mignard succeeded Rigaud as portrait painter, worthy to preserve the features of Bossuet and Fenelon. The unity of organization, the brilliancy of style, the imposing majesty which the king's taste had everywhere stamped about him, upon art as well as upon literature, were by this time beginning to decay simultaneously with the old age of Louis XIV, with the reverses of his arms, and the increasing gloominess of his court. The artists who had illustrated his reign were dying one after another, as well as the orators and the poets. The sculptor James Sarrazin had been gone some time. Puget and the Anguier were dead, as well as Mansart, Perrault, and Le Nôtre. Girardon had but a few months to live. Only Coisevaux was destined to survive the king, whose statue he had many a time moulded. The great age was disappearing slowly and sadly, throwing out to the last some noble gleams, like the aged king who had constantly served as its centre and guide, like olden France, which he had crowned with its last and its most splendid wreath. End of section 74. End of chapter 48. End of a popular history of France from the earliest times, volume 5, by François Guizot.